Uh, good morning, everybody. This is episode 29. Episode 29, uh, since we started counting. Now there are more than 29 episodes, and there are some episodes that don't have this slate. So we're at least 29 episodes in, and I, I'm guesstimating over 30 something. Anyways, today we're going to be talking about the compound effect uh, written by Darren Hardy. And Darren Hardy is the founder of Success Magazine. And he has a pretty impressive resume of things he's done. Unfortunately, one of the things he hasn't done is provided us, the internets, with a good photo of himself. And so this is the best photo I could find. I don't know why it is that public speaking, public people like this don't have better headshots. Anyways, I'm sharing my screen. So if there's ever an issue uh, and it, it's locked on one slide for too long, just say, hey, is there another slide going on? If it feels like what I'm saying is not lining up with the slides, okay? So far, Zoom has been really good. And I'm thinking this is our new home. Anyways, this is what the book looks like, The Compound Effect. And of course, always use affiliate link uh, to buy the book if you want to. It's a fairly inexpensive book. It's $15.99 US. So if you buy it on Amazon, it's a lot cheaper than that. Okay. Um, I asked earlier if anybody did the homework. And you, some of you guys that are brand new to the group are wondering what homework, what's going on? Did I miss something? Yes, you did. This is what's going on. But... More often than not, our people do not do the homework, and that's totally up to you because I, this is an entrepreneurial group. This is not a daycare center. It's up to you to do what you need to do to get your business on track, okay? And we, I'm going to introduce some new ideas to this group, and so if you guys are tuning in um, at a time when this is not live, I want you to start doing what we're talking about in this deck in particular, all right? We went over the million-dollar proposal last, last call, and we talked about learning from our losses as much as we learn from our wins. And so I asked you guys, what big deal did you lose recently? And what did you do well and what could, be, what could you do better? These two questions serve as a really, really good prompts in evaluating any situation. Uh, oftentimes when, when something doesn't go our way, I think the tendency is to get really negative. Uh, one of the things that we do is we blame people and we tried to figure out excuses why it didn't work. I didn't want that job anyways. I was going to go on vacation. I didn't need a million dollars. That would have changed our company, and I'm not comfortable changing our company that way. Or I don't know how to get the work done. Lots of reasons. Uh, but these, as my coach and therapist have told me before, they're learning opportunities. When things go bad, uh, the faster you can get from sitting there and feeling horrible about it to looking at it like this is a learning opportunity, in Jacob's case, when he's working with people that are clearly taking advantage of him, I, I wouldn't get mad at them. I wouldn't be resentful of the relationship, Jacob. What I would sit there and think, what am I doing in my life that I'm attracting these kinds of people? What kind of person do I need to become? And how do I need to adjust the way I evaluate who I can trust and what I can give away? And I, I recently put out a video on giving away 100%. And obviously, there's a little clickbait-ish kind of idea there. Uh, because obviously if you give away 100%, what do you have left for yourself? Uh, the asterisk to that thing that I did not say is give 100% of yourself while not hurting yourself in the process. So if you have a 40-hour work week and that's what you have to do, you cannot give away 39 of those hours to somebody else and then figure out how to do your work after, after the fact. And that can be tricky, especially for creative people. I think there's a nature in us that, w that really feels good to help people, that we want to please people. And sometimes we do that at our own detriment. But anyways, hopefully you guys are looking at your own deals and saying, what can we do better? Okay. And I, as has been pointed out to me, um, astrologically, I'm a Capricorn. And, and Jose tells me this is what that means, is that I'm a goat and goats climb up the mountain. They're very sheer surfaces and they just take little jumps and they just keep jumping. And I think that principle has served me really well all my life. Everything we do, good or bad, <clears throat> excuse me, I try to spend some time thinking about what can I do better? What's one or two things I can tweak and do better? So if you guys use that, you're going to do really well in your own career, okay? All right. So if you did the homework, what I would like for you to do, because I didn't see any of it, is to post it in the event. Post it in this event. Just add, a t add an image, write the deal down. What'd you do better? It could be two columns. Here's what we could do better. Uh, what do we do well? Acknowledge that first, I'm sorry. And then what, what could we do better? Anyways, um, kicking off into the book, I always like to start these book reviews with a quote. And the quote comes from Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins. And you guys know him. He's a best-selling author, 
entrepreneur, and he describes himself as a peak performance strategist. I like that. And his quote is, your decisions shape your destiny. And this ties in directly with the concept of the compound effect, okay? Your decisions shape your destiny. All right, this one is going to be me talking and, and sharing everything that it is I learned, but you guys feel free to interrupt me. I'm not going to sit there and pause and say, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I will forget. So if you want to ask me anything, just interrupt. It's totally cool. This is a conversation, okay? And we're all looking at slides together. So here's the basic concept of the compound effect. Small, smart choices apply consistency consistently over time will have a radical difference. That is the entire compound effect formula. And there's lots of ways that he explains this. And for those of you guys that like stories, I will share some stories about this. Now, it's deliberately written that small, smart choices. Because in our society, we talk about these radical shifts, the paradigm shifts, these big changes that happen. He doesn't really believe in that. The key here is consistency. And in consistency, you must take action. Okay? So here's the story. It's called a magic penny. Okay, so if I were to ask you guys right now, I don't want you to think about this too hard, all right? If I were to give you one of two options, I'm gonna give you $3 million, or I'm gonna give you one penny, and that doubles for 31 days, which would you choose? Now most of us would sit there and like, holy cow, $3 million, I'll take that right now. Because one penny, that's nothing. And even if it doubles, 31 days, that's not enough time. And sure enough, if you had chosen the, the, um, the 31 days with one penny, here's the difference, okay? One person who took the money up front would get $3 million. The person who took the penny that doubled every single day, compounded, would have $10,737,418. So that's to help you understand that little insignificant things that don't really do anything, that it's almost like these changes are almost invisible to you but if you keep doing it over a period of time, they will have a big and dramatic impact on your life. That's the entire concept of the book. And then the rest of it just kind of gets more and more stories. Okay. You guys understand that? So most of us are like, you know, if you do the math, scratching our head, like how could that be? How could one penny in 31 days be $10 million? And you'll notice uh, in day 30, it's at $5 million. And at day, um, uh, uh, what is it, 29, it's actually less than the 3 million. It's 2.5. So if you quit any point in time, prior to the last three days, you're going to wind up short. And this is the thing. So his whole thing is about finding habits that you can do every single day. And hence the small changes. Okay. And he's like, you know, in our society, we're often told about uh, get rich quick, a, a crash diet, a crash course, how to get there fast, you know, uh, six minute abs, four, four hour work week, four minute workouts, those kinds of things. And he's like, none of that works. None of it works. It will work in the short term, but if you can't maintain it over the rest of your life, it's just not going to work. Okay. Uh, I was running short on time. I wanted a bullet, but the, the pill I think is an apropos uh, analogy or metaphor. Okay. So this is all about like, it's counterintuitive. That setting big goals, doing big, big things, big changes, dramatic New Year's resolutions, all that kind of stuff will get you the results that you want. But more often than not, people just quit. They just quit. So in the old parable of the tortoise and the hare, you definitely need to be the tortoise in this race. And each one of you guys can have a separate goal, but the application of the goal and how you get there is almost always the same. All right. I don't know if I'm too intense for you guys this morning. If anybody wants to talk about anything, I'm, I'm happy to. Okay. So then he gets into this whole thing. Um, some key concepts that he didn't use these words, but uh, I, I like this idea and we've talked about it before on our calls. Okay. This whole idea of the autopilot mode, which is we make unconscious decisions all day long. So what we have to become is aware of the decisions that we're making so we can make more positive changes things that our parents taught us, society, our teachers, our culture, they've left a blueprint for us to follow uh, and we're totally unaware of it. It's been ingrained in us. Uh, whether you chew with your mouth open, uh, whether you look both ways before crossing the street, or if you hold the door open for somebody, or if you give up your seat for an elderly person or a pregnant woman, 
Those are things that are part of your DNA, part of your blueprint. Those are mostly good things, but there are a lot of bad things. And so we need to become aware of all that stuff. And we need to take control of this. And the reason why there's a car thing on autopilot is because when you're driving, and I learned this in college, that's one form of self-hypnosis. You, you notice how sometimes you get in the car and you've been to a place many times, you almost kind of wake up in the parking lot and wonder like, how did I get here? It's a form of self-hypnosis. So there are all these unconscious decisions that we're making that are having an impact on our lives. All right. And he, we have, I'm going to talk about tools on how to, to become aware of that and how to change it. This other part, uh, I, I wanted a mirror, but it didn't work out. He says that in every relationship, you need to take a 100% responsibility. Okay. Because he said, like, you know, if you talk to somebody about their personal relationship, like a husband and wife, you would say, well, what's your responsibility? What percentage is your responsibility for the relationship going well? And, and most people would say 50-50. And that sounds like a really good answer because it's a partnership. And some people, some very um, chivalrous person might say, I think it's 51%. And he said it's wrong because if that marriage fails, if your relationship fails, you can blame lots of people, but it's still a failure. And so the only way you can change that and make sure it's a success is to take 100% responsibility for it. And this gets away from the idea of blaming others, making excuses, blaming situations and circumstances, okay? And so if you look at any relationship you have in your life, and I think you have a relationship with your business, you need to be 100% 100 responsible because if you're not, you're not going to take the action that you need to, to change it. Okay. Um, so I, I actually have something to say there. Um, so while I, I, I really appreciate that, you know, you need to accept what you've done in a certain situation that outside sources are very, uh, detrimental and 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 I think that this dialogue is very it can be useful as perhaps shock therapy and I, I appreciate that value of it but I also have a concern with possibly shift that idea easily shifting to an acceptance of blame for other things that happened to you that really weren't your fault so there's a clear distinction there to me that could be potentially harmful that I don't know. I feel like it's being steamrolled over in that kind of a dialogue. That's fine, Jacob. And I'm just trying to give you the information as I consumed it. We mm -hmm. can debate later or anytime. And I actually enjoy this part of it, whether or not you think it's uh, applicable to your life or if you agree or disagree with it. I'm not saying it like if I read the Quran to you guys or the Bible, and my mission is to give you the information as best as I can to be a great teacher of that information. And then later on, we can say like, well, how would you apply that? Or I have some questions and that's where the teacher would come in. I'll tell you this, mm -hmm. in my life, I'm just speaking personally, there's lots of things that have happened to me. How do I put this back down? Switch the active speaker. Uh, did it work? Are you guys seeing my screen or are you still seeing Jacob full screen? I see you. You see me? Okay. Anyways, uh, in my life, lots of things have happened to me, and I used to complain about them. Like, um, why, why does the, this person show up to work and not do this? Why did the client decide to go X, Y, and Z? All I can know is this, Jake, Jacob. These things have happened to you, and though they're not, like somebody hits you, right? Uh, for example, you're driving a car, and somebody just T-bones you right in the middle of the intersection. It's not even, you, you full green light, there's really... Mm -hmm. Now, what we can do is the decisions that we make about what has happened in that moment determine our entire outlook in life, okay? We can sit there and say, you've interrupted my life. You've ruined everything. You've hit me. You were careless. You weren't paying attention. That's a lot mm -hmm. of negativity, okay? I'm going to get out of that situation. I'm going to say, is everybody in the car okay? I have my health, and this is just an object. This is interruption of my day, but let's also make sure the other person is okay. I'm pretty sure they did not intentionally tried to hit me. It was a moment of carelessness and I've been there myself. And I wanna move on from that situation. So if I sit there and dwell on the negative parts, that's all I'm going to do. And he talks about this a little bit, okay? So we can either choose to uh, accept the situation, try to find the positive and move on with our lives and try to figure out, you know, next time when I drive through the intersection, I'm supposed to do what my uh, driving instructor told me to do, which is 
to always cross-check the traffic, which is a habit that I've had since I was 16. I'm not going through an intersection, okay? I'm, I'm looking always to the left. It's called defensive driving. That's what I do, okay? So I know this can be shocking, and a lot of us are in circumstances that are less than ideal. I happen to know your story a little bit more, and so let's keep moving, okay? All right, let me go share the screen. And you guys, interrupt me anytime you want. That was a good interruption, okay? Yeah, I will Thanks, say I've been, reading a, I've been reading another book uh, called- uh, I, I can't tell who's talking. Oh, uh, Chris. Oh, Chris, okay, sorry. I've been reading another book called The Charisma Myth, and one of the things she suggests is to, is that you get to decide how you interpret things. So if, for instance, someone cuts you off, you can sort of make up a possible explanation why the person did that to get yourself out of like ruminating about it. Yes. There are a lot of philosophers, um, uh, what you would call like uh, Zen philosophers, Buddhists, all those kind of Taoists and people talking about how reality has very little to do with how you feel about it. And, and if you change the lens, you change everything. Sean Arker talks about this in The Science of Happiness in his, in, on his TED Talk. Like how you look at the world determines how you're going to feel about it more than the reality itself. And there's stories and stories about how two people who get shot, one person feels grateful and thankful, and the other person feels like it's ruined their life. Like somebody's actually glad they were shot. And I've told this story before, okay? And uh, I'm not going to tell the story right now. There's a, there's a podcast on this. And I think it's on uh, Radio Lab. if you guys want to look it up, okay? Uh, anyways, there's this great quote, uh, because cause people talk about like, well, you're really lucky. And Arnold Palmer, the professional golfer, one of the greats, he has this quote and says, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Okay? So what we want to do is start to become hyper aware of the decisions that we're making. And the way that we do that is we got to start journaling. Uh, in his video, Matthew and Tina showed you his, his journal and what he's doing every single day. And what we're going to do is this. Anything that you care about, anything that you want to change, whether you want to get in shape, if you want to be more efficient, if you want to optimize your day, for example, if you want to save some money, start journaling. And the key is to do this for 21 days and to make a commitment to do this. One of the homework assignments today is to make a public commitment, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Okay? Take record of everything that you do for 21 days as it relates to, the, to whatever it is you're trying to change. So let's take one, for example, calories. We can all eat a little bit better, okay? So if you start tomorrow and you're like, you know what, for the next 21 days, I'm gonna log every single thing I eat. First, it starts out annoying, then it becomes enlightening, and then it becomes really fun and changes your life. And there are many stories that he shares about how somebody starts to do this and it changes their life. And I'm going to tell you, uh, this is not some BS I read in a book, but this is something I've done myself. Early on in, in my uh, time with my business coach, Kier McLaren, he told me, you know what? I want you to do something. I want you to keep a journal um, and I want you to write down everything that you're doing because I don't know if you're focusing your energies on the right things. And at first I was taken aback that this is like almost, no, it's over 10 years ago, I think. And I started to write down everything because I'm a good student. Even if I don't agree with doing it, I'm going to do it anyways. And I started writing. It only took me three days to change my life. I realized I was spending too much time uh, doing nonsensical things, things that are just some, something that another person in the office could do. This is how he helped me to get out of micromanaging projects, how I started to trust my team and let them do what they need to do. And it was a big moment. A lot of people have that problem. People who are, are makers, and I was one myself, and I'm a little bit of a control freak. I want to work on it. I want to like noodle things. But then I realized I wasn't getting the big stuff taken care of. I wasn't talking to the clients. I wasn't working on my talks uh, in terms of my keynote presentations. I wasn't doing any of the stuff that I am doing today. And the only way I became aware of that was to log everything down. So... I'm going to challenge each and every single person on this call, if you're listening to this later, to also make a commitment to pick one thing that you're going to log for 21 days that you're going to see something crazy happen. Okay? He has a little story, uh, and he has lots of examples. 
And he talks about how when there's a horse race, uh, horses often win just by a nose, one length, one tiny little bit. And he's saying that the horse that wins gets 10 times more prize money. So let's say second place gets a million dollars and the first place horse gets $10 million. He says that horse is not 10 times as strong or as fast. But what he's talking about is when you put in the work consistently done over time, you can have these dramatic results. So he talks about athletes, whether you're um, a cyclist or you're a swimmer like Michael Phelps, the, the reason why he's a world champion and the winningest medal, uh, gold medal as ever or Olympic Olympian is because he puts in the work every single day since he was like 11 years old or something like that. There's a pattern of consistent habits and a following through and these tiny little things. And so he says his coach measures every single thing he eats, looks at every single rep and they log and watch every little component. And this is what makes him a world champion and why he has so many gold medals. Okay. And if we're looking at golfers again, I guess he likes golf. Um, what is the difference between the number one player and the number 10 player? And he, he, and he put it together, the average is just 1.9 strokes, not even two strokes different, separates number one from number 10. And there's a five times difference in terms of what money they make. So these little, little things matter. And those habits that we, we have um, involuntarily or voluntarily signed up for are impacting us adversely in some ways, okay? So the key idea is to choose one new easy habit to adopt. And he has a story about the half marathon, okay? So there's a woman and she was, uh, she wanted to look good for her uh, high school reunion. And, and he had suggested and talked to her a little bit, like, what's your motivation? She goes, well, I, I, I want to look good. I don't want to come back as a sad version of myself. And he goes, well, let's start, um, let's start very simply, okay? Here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to map out from your home one mile. And I want you to walk just one mile and just do that and come back. So you know exactly the point at which you need to walk to and come back, and that's one mile. So she would do that. And then he would check in with her every single week. So this is a long, slow process. So the next week, he was, how you do? She's like, I'm, I'm good. I surprised myself. I walked and it was good. And then he says, okay, next thing you do is I want you to, to jog or run. And whenever you feel short of breath, I want you to stop and walk the rest. I want you to just keep doing that. The, so the following week, she did it. Again, he challenges her and she's making one little change. So run a little bit more. So eventually she was able to run half the distance and stop and then ran the full distance. And then she added two miles, three miles, five miles until she was running the half marathon. And today, in his office, he tells the story, she's become a role model and inspiration for everybody. Not only did she look great for her reunion, but now she's become a whole different person. So it started uh, to impact her life in so many different ways, okay? So she lost a lot of weight. She felt more confident. She felt happier about herself. She felt more beautiful. So her relationship with her husband got better. And then she started to look at the office and change things at the office. And it had this really positive impact for her entire life. And so that's like this kind of ripple effect, the chain reaction that happens when you start taking control of your life and you accept the things that you can control and change. Okay. So he says also, like, we have to be very careful of the habits that we've developed. And the story goes something like this. He says that a man invited a young person into a forest and he says, you know, here's an oak sapling. I want you to pull that out. So the young person looks at the man. It's like, I can do that. So he, he comes out and he pulls it out with ease. And then the next thing, he'd walk to a little bit more developed um, sapling, pull that out. So he got in there and he pulled it out. This time it was a little bit harder to pull out. Then he walked to a sprouting tree and it's not gigantic, but you know, he said, pull that one out. So he walked over to that one and then he tried to pull that one out. This time he really had to plant his feet down, grab the, the, the trunk and just pull. And with a lot of effort, he was able to finally pull it out. Then he says, okay, you're almost done. So he's like kind of wiping the sweat off his brow. The old man says, I want you to pull that tree down. Pull that tree out right there. And he looks at it, and this tree sprouts all the way up into, you know, 
I don't know, 20 feet up. He goes, there's no way I can pull that out. He goes, okay, so these are like our habits, the things that we've developed over time, okay? And the deeper the habit, the thing that we've done longer is the harder thing to pull out. And so we have to be very careful about the things that we choose to do. And we can start to form new, more positive things, but it's going to be very difficult to do. We need to acknowledge it's not going to be easy, okay? All right, guys, I'm, I'm going super fast because I feel like I have a lot to cover here, but maybe I'm going faster than I thought I was going to go. So if you guys want to interrupt me, I'm going to encourage you again. But otherwise, I'm going to keep talking, okay? Now, he says if you take a coast-to-coast -coast flight from Los Angeles to New York and you just go off, by, off course by one degree, you'll end up 150 miles off course. So he has lots and lots of stories about how little changes can have a gigantic impact on your life. So if you're not convinced, uh, by the time you read like all 30 stories, um, you will, I think, because there's so many examples that he has. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about another, another concept that he shared. So one of his uh, assistants uh, was helping him organize all the talks that he does. And he talks a lot about taking some money out from your paycheck and then putting it into the bank. We've all been told that if you take, I don't know, 5% out of your paycheck uh, every single week or every two weeks, whenever you get the check and you put it in a bank account with the interest and it compounds annually, by the time you're ready to retire, you'll have millions of dollars. And so few of us are able to do this. It's a very insignificant amount. So she's like, you know, uh, I make $40,000. Um, I've tried to do everything I can. I can't survive on anything, you know, less than this. And so there's no way I can save 5%. So I, I would like to get a raise so I can start applying the principles that you've been teaching. And he says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do one better. I'm going to help you save 5%. Okay. So her reaction wasn't great. Her reaction is I wanted more money. I wanted to raise and you're telling me you're going to teach me something. And he goes, I will teach you and you will make more money in the long run. So the first thing he asked her to do was, okay, let's cut out um, the sandwich and the chip and the soda you buy. And I'm not talking about every single day. I want you to cut it out four of the five days that you work. So those days I want you to just pack a lunch and bring your own food. And so at the beginning, it was a horrible experience for her. She didn't want to do it. Uh, she preferred going to the cafeteria or the deli and just buying whatever it is she needed to buy. But ultimately, she started to make the sandwiches and it became fun for her. And she stopped buying it at the deli altogether. So she was able to save X dollars a month. Then he says, okay, um, these magazines that you subscribe to, like uh, People, Us Magazine, um, Vanity Fair, let's cut that out. We really don't need that. And they're actually taking away your time from doing the things that you need to do. Cut that out. He says, you know, um, you, you go to Starbucks every single day. Let's cut that out. I want you to go buy your own ground coffee and make it yourself. And then so she became a connoisseur of coffee. And a lot of people came to her and, you know, asked her, like, what are you brewing? You know, what's going on? Tell me more about what, the roast that you're doing today. Okay. So slowly and surely, she was able to save whatever that percentage was, 5 or 10%, by making small decisions. And what happened was, after she went through this whole transformative process, she came back to him and she said, you know, I'd like to make more money. So I'm going to propose something to you. I've been looking around the office and how we spend money. I'd like to get 5% of all the money that I can figure out how we can save at the office. Would you be game to do that? To which he said, yes. And she also then asked him, I have also some ideas on how we can make more money. So can I get 10% of all the new business ideas that I'm able to create that lead to us making more money? And again, he said, yes. So, so after the first year he, she worked for him, she made $40,000. The very next year, she made $130,000, way more than the raise that she was asking. And he said that after a few short years, she left the company, started her own, her own consulting company, teaching people how to do this for their own organizations. Okay, so that's the story. Questions? All right, kind of keep going. Okay, uh, he talks a lot about uh, willpower versus why power. 
He says, why power is a lot more important than willpower. It's your motivation. It's the thing that ignites your passion. So he says, every time you want to do something, ask yourself, why? Why do I want to do this? What's really driving at that? He says, it's very important to know your why, because that's what's going to keep you going for a long time. So if you want to lose weight uh, for, you know, uh, I don't know, for vanity reasons, it, it might get you going for a while. But if you want to lose weight because you want to see your grandkids uh, get married, that's a much more powerful why, because you want to be healthy and you want to live a longer time because there are other people that you want to see through life, people that count on you. So understanding your why power, we've talked about this before, at least in this group, about understanding your why. And the very simple way that you find your why is you just ask yourself why, like a little kid. Why do I want to do this? Why? And you give an answer. You just keep digging deeper and deeper until you find the true reason. And that's who you are deep down inside. Okay. Another quote from Jim Rohn, who a lot of people cite as a key mentor influencer in their lives. So this guy, Darren Hardy, is super successful. And so he talks about Jim Rohn. And if you guys haven't um, figured out Jim Rohn yet, go on YouTube, go watch his video. He reads his entire book. Jim Rohn is one of the pioneers of the, this whole kind of business philosopher concept. The business coach mentor to lots of people, including Tony Robbins and a lot of other people. So he says, when something is tough, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better. Because if you want something that other people don't have, you can have to do something that other people don't do. So whenever uh, Darren faces something that's a very difficult challenge, he kind of gets really excited. He rubs his hands together and he gets really invigorated because he says, I will out hustle every single person. I want it to be hard because those people will quit and I will not quit. And he shares the story about how Lance Armstrong was able to climb the mountain, which he's not known as being a good climber and how he breaks through the wall and he knows in his soul that they will break before him. He talks about Muhammad Ali fighting, uh, George Foreman, how Muhammad Ali was an underdog in that fight. And they were saying Foreman will kill him because he's killed everybody else. And he noticed that George Foreman would win and beat most of his opponents within four or five rounds. So Muhammad Ali came in there with a really strange strategy. And it was later on termed as the rope-a-dope. Muhammad Ali came into the ring and he just let George Foreman hit him for like nine rounds or something like that, just punishing him. All he would do is cover his face and dodge and weave, and he was just getting pummeled to the body. At some point there, George broke. He's like, this guy's not going to go down. And that's when Muhammad Ali did his flurry and knocked him out to the shock uh, and amazement of the world, right? So he knew where his breaking point was, and he knew he was an outlast and outgrind George Foreman. Okay. Um, something he talks about in the book called the law of attraction is like when we put our minds to something, something that we want to achieve, and it's very clear for us, it's really interesting. Then the filters in our mind open up to all this information that's available. So when I was looking to buy a car, all of a sudden, all these, uh, articles started popping up in my feed. They were always there. Just, I wasn't looking for it. So he's like, what is your goal for each one of these things? So there's a little graph here, right? What's your goal for, for business, for finance, for health, for well-being, for spirituality, for family, for relationships and your lifestyle? Be very clear and write these things down. And you're going to start to see this information is going to start to appear to you. And it's really strange. I'll give you an example. Two years ago, uh, I was uh, going to do a talk on confidence and, and how to achieve confidence for creatives. And I was struggling with this thing. And all of a sudden, I'm thumbing through a Time Magazine article, and it talked about resilience and how people who grow up in harsh environments, uh, children who are foster kids, who have never had a parent, how they are remarkably resilient and go on to become very successful people. And I started to think about my own experience. And then articles started to appear. People in my life started coming up to me and saying, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on this confidence thing. I'm really struggling. Then they started sending me links to things to read and things that they wanted to share with me. So whatever you put your mind to is what it attracts, the law of attraction. 
okay? Um, performance partner, something that we're gonna do new to this group. I want you all to pick a peak performance partner or success partner. It's somebody that you relate to inside this group and what you're gonna do is you're gonna make a commitment to call and talk to each other once a week for 30 minutes. You're gonna share your wins, your losses, uh, what you need to do to fix things, your aha moments, and you're gonna give feedback and it's gonna be very clear and direct, and you're gonna hold each other accountable, okay? So for over 10 years, I had a business coach who came in to see me every single week. Unless I was sick or traveling, I would see him every single week for 10 years. Now, one thing that I found kind of interesting that was happening to me was, he would talk to me and we would talk about things we needed to accomplish for next week. And sure enough, we would meet on Thursdays, I think. Every Wednesday night, I was up late grinding through as much of my list as I could just because I didn't want to let him down. So, so it's so easy for us to say, tomorrow I'll start that exercise program. Tomorrow um, I will begin dieting. Tomorrow I'm going to make those new business calls. And then tomorrow comes and then we keep punting it. But when you know somebody's going to hold you accountable, somebody you respect to tell it, tell you like it is, I think things are going to change. So I want you guys to do this for each other. This group has been hovering around a hundred plus people and we've not had some major breakthroughs yet. Okay. My goal was to get as many of you guys across the million dollar mark as possible. And I've not done a good enough job. I've been sitting here telling you all the keys to success, things that you need to do but I think we need to kick this into a new gear. And I'm gonna tell you some things that I've already changed in my life having read the book not that long ago. Okay, you guys are gonna pick a performance partner in this group, and you're gonna hold each other accountable, and we're gonna check in from you from time to time. But you would check in with each other consistently on a day unless something weird happens, and you're gonna to talk to each other for 30 minutes. Okay, all right. Let's talk about these things that are very difficult, the things that we want to achieve and why they're so difficult. So you guys all know the law of inertia, right? The law of inertia states that a body at rest tends to stay at rest and a body in motion tends to stay in motion, something like that. That's what I remember from science class. And it's all to do with momentum, what he calls big mo. And big mo is your friend. And he gives several examples. And I'll talk to you about one of them, a train. Uh, and he talks about the rocket and a water pump, okay? And he has a couple more in there, but let's talk about a train. A train, a locomotive, sits on a track. It doesn't take a lot to keep that train from not moving. In fact, it just takes a wooden wedge. They lay these large wooden uh, wedges uh, right in front of the wheels, and with that, it can't move. It can't get off the tracks. So when they want to start the train, they pull the wedges out, and they start to fire up the engine, shoveling coal in there. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy just to get the wheels slightly turning. And it huffs and it puffs and it keeps, you know, and eventually this train starts to move and you hear the metal, metal kind of grinding, right? And eventually it starts to move at a certain speed that then it requires very little energy to keep moving. At this point, the train is like flying down the track. Hence the uh, expression, it, uh, it goes on rails, right? It just slides, it just goes. And he says at this point, you know, even a five, ton, a five foot thick reinforced concrete wall won't be enough to stop it. It'll blast right through it. And this is when you have momentum on your side. But to realize that it takes a lot of work to get that movement where it seems like you're not even moving forward and you're pushing and you're pushing and you're not getting anywhere. The same thing goes for a rocket. He says most of the fuel for a rocket is expelled at the earliest stages. That's why they dump that whole thing and the shuttle takes off once it's able to, br to break gravity. So gravity is a very powerful force. And the same thing with a water pump, okay? Just realize this is going to be hard. <clears throat> And you want it to be hard because that's, that's what's going to separate, separate you from everybody else. And that if you just give up just a little bit, 
you're going to set yourself back really far. So consistency, you kind of, it's much easier to, to maintain the momentum if you put in the effort every single day. So he says, here's how I, I do my day. And he, he has a very rigorous thing. Um, he, talk about, he talks about how to bookend your day because the stuff in the middle you can't control. He knows how he can wake up and he knows how he can go to sleep. Everything else he doesn't know about. So here's how his day looks like, okay? This is the morning routine and then he has a night routine. He wakes up. The first thing he does is he, he thanks and thinks about all the things he is grateful for. One, for being alive. Uh, two, to have these wonderful children, to be in love with his wife, and his wife is in love with him. He goes through all these things. He thinks about the positive things in his life, okay? And then he does what many would consider a prayer, and he's kind of like doing a mental love letter to somebody in his life, a friend, his wife, a relative, a coworker, and he's just sending positive energy to them, okay? Then he thinks about his goal. What's the goal that he needs to achieve today? And the three things he has to do to achieve it. Okay. And then what he does is he exercises uh, for a few minutes while he's waiting for his coffee to be ready. So when he's waiting for his coffee, I think he's stretching and doing yoga and things like that. As you get older, you need to stretch more, right? And then he gives himself 30 minutes to read. No more, no less. Exactly 30 minutes. And he, he wants to read things that are positive or instructional, things that are going to help him. And then he does what he calls 60 minutes of focused work. Everything that he needs to do to accomplish his goals for that day. Then he spends about 15 minutes uh, calibrating the rest of his day. Like, here's what I'm going to do the rest of my day. Okay, then he reviews his top one to five year goals, his top one and five year goals to see if he's on track to hitting it. So he's looking at just the day and then he's looking long term, mid to long term. It's only then that he sends emails. He'll open up his email program and he'll send out his delegation emails to his entire team. So he's like in rapid fire mode because now he knows exactly what he needs to do. It's very clear. And the reason why the email is the last thing he does in the morning schedule is once you open up that email, you can totally derail. You don't drink your coffee. You don't exercise. You don't look at your goal and see how, how you're doing, if you're making progress towards your goal or not. So think about that. Nighttime. Of course, he gets into bed. Now he's reviewing his day. How did we do today? Did we get everything done? What happened? What could we do better? Okay, we didn't get everything done today. What are the carryover items? And during the day, I had a bunch of new ideas. So he's going to journal the new ideas. And he makes a point to read at least 10 pages of something that's inspirational. There's some studies that talk about the last 30 minutes of, of you being conscious impact what you think about when you go to sleep, what you dream about. And I believe this 100%. So don't read the tabloids. Don't read uh, CNN. Don't read about the things in the news. He says he makes it a point not to read any news on any channel ever. He says that 90% of the information is just really negative stuff. Somebody gets blown up, the economic crisis, all these kind of things. He says most of it has no impact on him on a personal level and he can do nothing about the things that he reads about, but they will consume a lot of your time. So he says instead he has an RSS feed that only collects the things that he wants to read about. Uh, we're going to talk about influence you guys. And I think we're almost done here. I've got four or five more slides and that's it. Wow. I can't believe I got through all this. I thought I was going to do this in two parts. Okay. Influence. Okay, we have to be very careful uh, about the people we surround ourselves and the things that we associate with and the environment that we're in. So he talks about these concepts in depth, okay? The input, what you feed your mind. 
So this is why he's like, I don't want to do any more CNN or Fox. I don't do any of that kind of stuff. I don't read any tabloids or gossip magazines. I don't want to do anything with celebrity lifestyles. None of that. That's all kind of pollution for him. Then he talks about it, the people he spends his time with, association. And he then quotes Jim Rohn about, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I realize I don't have a close friend of some Okay? And think about that, you guys. Like, why are we all in this group together? Why are we giving up very precious time not working on our business? There's at least 17 of us when we started. Why are we doing this? Because all of us in this group have made a commitment to better ourselves. And that's why this group is very important to your personal growth. Because you might be in a very remote area or be around people that have no understanding about how to run a business or how to run a creative business at that. So the people we're spending time with dramatically impact what we're going to do and how we think. Okay. I think there's another slide here that talks about that. Let me see where it is. Yeah. So if we look at the average of the five people we spend the most time with, look at the quality of health they have, the wealth and their attitude. And this one's going to hurt you a little bit. Okay. Think about that. Is if you want to know what you're going to make, average the five people together and you'll find out, you know, what they make, average it together. And that's what you're going to make. Are they, are they healthy? Are, are they exercising? Are they eating well? What's their mm -hmm. attitude in life? Negative people hang out with negative people and it drags you down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about that. Okay. And so what we have to do is we have to guard our mind. So he says our cup starts full and how much junk there is in there. We don't know, but we got to flush the junk out. And there's a lot of garbage that's in there. We got to purify our mind. Some of you guys are old enough to have kids. I have two. And we say as parents, we don't want them hanging around with bad influences. Guard your mind, you guys. He says the most successful people that he's interviewed for the magazine, it doesn't matter because they've had years of interviewing everybody from Oprah and everybody up and down. They all consistently spend a lot of their money on growing and hiring coaches and, and professional development. So it's very important that you would think that the most successful people are already there. They don't need anymore, yet they still go to coaches and they hire and they go to seminars. They seek out mentors that can contribute and teach them new things. Hey, the audio died just at the right time because I'm almost done with my deck here. Here's the homework. Here's your tracking pledge, you guys. So you're going to say, I'm going to start tracking whatever, what I eat from this day, month, and year on forward. Okay? For 21 days. It's a 21-day pledge. And you're going to make that. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to find your peak performance partner. Hopefully, it's Peter that you pick as your peak performance partner. I will meet with Peter on X day and time. You're going to make that commitment towards each other. There's 100 people in here at least. So there are at least 50 partnerships that you can have. And it will cost you exactly $0 because you're going to help each other out. There's one last item here. And I need to copy this slide. And there it is. Law of attraction. We need to know what our goals are. And be very specific about your business goals, your finance, etc. I think that's it. There's an Amazon affiliate thing I mentioned. And that's all I got for you for this deck. And I'm going to end keynote here and we're just going to talk.